Hello and welcome to International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines Peru's interim president resigns after death of two protesters, conflict in Ethiopia's Tigray region escalates, Polisario Front condemns Moroccan aggression in Western Sahara, Trump remains defiant as his supporters mobilize in large numbers, and finally, we look at the COVID 19 spike in Europe and what governments could have done and did not do. In our first story, the constitution and political crisis in Peru has intensified with the resignation of interim president Manuel Berino on Sunday. The crisis began with the impeachment of President Martin Vizcarra by parliament last week. The impeachment was followed by massive protests on the streets, with protesters calling it a parliamentary coup. The pressure on the interim president Merino increased after the violent suppression of protests over the weekend, which also led to the assassination of two youth on Saturday. Over 40 protesters have been reported disappeared and over 100 were injured. Meanwhile, 13 of the 18 members of Merino's cabinet resigned, leading to the interim president himself quitting on Sunday. Manuel Merino's popular action party was in the forefront of the impeachment proceedings against Vizcarra. It is unclear what happens now. Congress has yet to elect an interim president, with clear divisions between the right-wing and the progressive blocs in the legislative bodies. Meanwhile, social movements have, demanding, have been demanding the refoundation of Peru with the drafting of a new constitution to address the deep structural issues facing the country. We go to Ethiopia, where the war in the northern region of Tigray is increasingly getting internationalized as the regional government's troops fired rockets across the northern border into Eritrea on Saturday. 25,000 refugees have fled across the western border into Sudan. In a separate attack in Berishangul Gumuz, a western regional state along the border with Sudan, unidentified gunmen killed 34 civilians in a passenger bus on Saturday night. This was termed by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission as a gruesome attack. This region does not share a border with Tigray but is located to the southwest of Amhara, whose regional government militia are also supporting the federal troops. So far, however, there are no links drawn between this attack and the armed conflict between the federal government and the regional government of Tigray. This conflict began on November 4th after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered the federal armed forces into Tigray to dislodge the ruling Tigray People's Liberation Front from the regional government. Ahmed accused its troops of attacking the Northern Command of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces in the city of Mekele. The TPLF had initially denied the accusation and claimed instead that soldiers of the Northern Command had defected to their side. However, on November 14th, a senior TPLF member admitted that it carried out a preemptive strike on this command. The TPLF was the dominant force in Ethiopia from the 1990s until 2018, when Abiy Ahmed came to power as Prime Minister. This was in the backdrop of an anti-government protest demanding greater civil and political rights. We now go to Western Sahara, where following the Moroccan aggression, the President of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic or the SADR, Brahim Ghali, on Saturday declared the end of its commitment to the United Nations mediated ceasefire agreement with Morocco. This agreement was signed in 91. Moroccan troops had entered the UN-designated buffer zone on Friday and used force to disperse protesters. These protesters were demanding the end of Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara and the conduct of a referendum to decide the status of the territory as per a UN Security Council resolution. President Brahim Ghali alleged that Morocco's act was in complete violation of the three-decade-old ceasefire in place in Western Sahara and against UN Security Council's resolutions. United Nations General Secretary Antonio Guterres has warned serious consequences for any violation of the ceasefire and change in the status quo in the region. The SADR was formed by the Polisario Front in 1976 after the Spanish withdrew from their erstwhile colony of Western Sahara. The western part of this region is currently under the territorial control of Morocco. Sections within Western Sahara under the leadership of the Polisario Front have been fighting and struggling to end the Moroccan occupation of the region. In the United States, buoyed by mass mobilization by supporters, US President Donald Trump continues to refuse to accept the results of the November 3rd elections. Around midnight on Sunday, Trump tweeted that he had won, keeping up his constant claims of election fraud, although there has been no evidence of the same. Earlier on Sunday and Saturday, Thousands of Trump supporters gathered in Washington, D.C. and in several other cities in the U.S. in the so-called Million MAGA March. The protesters chanted slogans such as Stop the Steal, alluding to Trump's claims that he had won the elections and the Democrats are trying to steal it. The call for the protest was circulated on social media. Several media organizations identified Proud Boys, a right-wing organization, to be the organizer. The protesters supported Donald Trump's bid to stay in the White House for a second term as president. They called the election of Democratic nominee Joe Biden as false and fraudulent. And let me repeat once again that there has been no evidence of fraud in the elections. Late in the night of Saturday, several clashes broke out in these protests between pro and anti-Trump groups. One protester was reportedly stabbed. Police said that they have arrested 20 protesters on charges of assault and possession of weapons. The electoral officials have denied Trump's allegations of fraud in the election as well. 
On Friday, after the declaration of results in the state of Georgia, Biden has further increased his lead over Trump. Joe Biden now has 306 electoral college votes, while Trump has only 232. For election as president, a candidate needs to secure a minimum of 270 electoral votes. And finally, Europe is going through a major spike in COVID-19 cases, and many countries have been forced to resort to lockdowns once again. We spoke to Alexis Benos of the People's Health Movement to understand how governments failed to prepare for the crisis after the first wave. So now we, we are coming today, and it is this is the very sad, I think, that instead of pushing some more, let's call them socialist policies towards health and self service and so on, in all Europe, the, the governments didn't care about that. They didn't do anything about the public health services. And actually, they used the pandemic crisis as an opportunity to expand the private sector in all countries also. For example, which is an aberrant issue, uh, in UK, they have um, outsourced the surveillance system. I mean, it's outsourced in private companies, in different private companies, which every company has its own system of recording, you know. So this is, uh, for epidemiology and public health, is a nonsense because you cannot have uh, homogenized uh, system of data Absolutely. that you can you know see what is happening and uh, evaluate and inference of, or that we have to do that or that or the other so this is a, one thing here in Greece the government said that they are going to use the uh, intensive care unit beds because we have a Greece is the the lowest in the European Union in rates with beds per population. So they said, okay, don't worry, we're going to use the beds of the private sector. And said, okay, that's a, that's a step. But after that, they said, okay, we're going to pay the, the private sector. And actually, they doubled the rate of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Just within the crisis, they doubled. And they said, okay, we're going, but we have to pay them more. So this is the, the old approach. And we're going, so we are, uh, we are, today in the in the middle of the second wave which is as you know it is uh, i mean even greater than what we were thinking of i mean we are expecting a second wave but this is much bigger uh, in in quantity and in the strength of incoming the society and we are literally unprepared for that in all countries of europe i say I, again uh, nothing has been done so today <clears throat> We are again in the same situation. And as you know, for example, here in Greece, we are now one week in lockdown. Austria today was get to lockdown. Lockdown is coming back as uh, the, only, the only solution because we don't have to uh, do anything. And here we are going to another issue regarding health, I mean, because it's not only to care for the people who are ill from uh, COVID or uh, whatever other listen, but also to see the uh, factors that are determining health, which is the social determination of health. And this pandemic, as we know already, is a big, uh, big danger for the massive health of the, of the population because it is driving masses of the population in impoverishment, okay, in uh, uh, famine, actually. In Europe, we are speaking about Europe, right? in famine so and all this uh, actually now these days we are discussing in greece and other countries that they are going to be how you say that expulsed by their houses because they you know they, they cannot pay the the rent or the the borrow that they have done mm -hmm. so all the all the so the, the factors or the, the the determinants of health which are food uh, house and so on and so on are hit then by that's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah,